yeah. So I just pop the top fell out of my um, piece of paper. Um, where was I? Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome back. Um, I wanted to carry on uh, talking about the, um, the NES conference that I attended. Um, there's uh, a few more things to talk about here. Uh, it's a bit, by the way, on a different note before I get onto the topic. I can't stand this heat, it's so hot, and the, the sun is so bright. I know some people love this heat, but I can't stand it. Um, it's rather taboo to say so, it's almost like heresy, but um, I love the winter. Um, I'm a winter person. I, um, I love the winter. Um, my favourite month is November because you're almost in winter and it's the darkest of the months. Um, November and December. Um, I don't like the heat and I don't like the sun. <laughs> I just go out to get my vitamin D, but I don't like. I don't actually enjoy it. Um, I like the. Um, I like days where it's kind of like cloudy, where you have um, gentle sunshine. I do like gentle sunshine. It's just I don't like sun when it's like really really bright and it like hurts your eyes and um it makes you feel really strained and like um it feels very oppressive and overstimulating um i just don't like it at all um yeah and i always feel more jaded and irritated around this time of year like almost like the, not sad it's like the opposite of sad it's kind of more irritation um but definitely seasons affect me just in a way they don't affect like I, most people are affected in the other way whereas i actually feel the best around when it gets really dark that's when i start to feel really full of energy and kind of quite happy and content is around November time. So I'm the opposite to most people. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd talk about that. Um, so yeah, I actually prefer it indoors today. I like wearing big hoodies as well and covering up, even when it's warm. I like wearing hoodies, although inside it's actually not, not too warm where I am. So cause it always, thankfully where I am inside is actually fairly cool and also I have all the blinds drawn. So. <laughs> but yeah, I do like, I just like wearing hoodies. So. Anyway, um, um, so yeah, so I was getting on to talking um, about, um, yeah, coming on talking about the conference I attended and I got and I was talking about the loneliness um, study and um, and, I was, and I'd got up to um, Rachel Fricker. Um, now Rachel Fricker um, is an autistic, um, what they call expert by experience, so she'd taken part um, in the loneliness study as an expert by experience and um, yeah she attended the National Autistic Society Mental Health Conference just to talk about some of her own personal experiences around loneliness and things. Um, so yeah so she talked a lot about her life, um, how she was very badly bullied at school, she's diagnosed autistic, dyspraxic and she also has ADHD. Um, she lives in a housing association home without she has a lot of support. Um, I think she said she has support. She has, I can't remember how many hours a week. She had quite a lot, quite intensive support. Um, because without that, you know, she struggled with her daily tasks. Um, she has a very spiky profile, though, so many people don't realise that she struggles so much until they know her well. Um, yeah, I can relate to that. Uh, spiky profile, very common in autism, whereby we often can appear. People often overestimate how able we are in certain areas because in other areas we can present as very able so we can be very able in some areas um, in like isolated areas that are often our areas of strength um, the mistake is that people the mistake people often make is to then generalize out from that and to assume that we're going to be equally good at other things that actually might be very very difficult for us more difficult than you might expect based upon our other areas of strength and based upon our chronological age and, our, and intelligence um so yeah so many people don't realize her struggles we're talking to her well she said she has social care support from a team of three personal assistants and they support her daily 30 hours a week um and then she talked about how, so this, this, this person was obviously very disabled by her autism. I thought it was quite good that they did have someone on there who was more disabled because some of the other speakers were comparatively very able. And um, yeah, so I thought, although I, I felt it was good they had someone who was more disabled on there, I felt that maybe they could have balanced it a bit more evenly and had a few more people like Rachel on there. Um, 
Oh yeah, she, so in terms of loneliness, she talked about how filling out forms for support is othering, as they highlight your otherness. It's humiliating and dehumanising. And not only that, but you are assessed over and over and over and over again. Um, so this constant reassessment of people with disabilities, this constant filling out of forms and bureaucracy is dehumanising and othering. And obviously it just focuses on a person's weaknesses and deficits and doesn't really look at them as a human being or as a person. It doesn't look at their interests, it doesn't look at their progress, it doesn't look at what motivates them or anything like that. It just focuses 100% on your deficits and you also have to paint like a picture of yourself that really just focuses on your deficits. And that's as unrealistic as, focus, as a picture you paint of yourself that just focuses on your strengths. It's not balanced. Um, and yeah, and it just creates a sort of cardboard copy kind of version of a, car of a caricature of a human being, really. Um, and this is what disabled people have to endure, this constant policing all the time. It almost feels like you're kind of, you've committed a crime almost, when obviously you haven't. Your only crime is that you exist and you're disabled. Um, but if you want to call it a crime, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, by the way. But um, yeah, it is dehumanising. Um, so I can I relate to that. Um, she also talks about, she made the point that loneliness is not just the absence of other people, but it's also the absence of those you connect with. So in other words, you could say be in a room with loads of people, um, but, you know, but if you don't feel you connect with them, if they're not on your wavelength, then you can still feel very, very lonely. Conversely, you might just have say one or two friends and yet still feel very connected because with those people you happen to connect really well. She talked about the issues in society, in yeah, a lot of many issues in society that obviously compound loneliness. For example, you often need to drive or use transport to get places and obviously that can be difficult for people who don't drive because a lot of, um, in order to get to places in society you often need a car or you need to have connections with other people and obviously if you find it hard to relate to other people and you might not have so many friends or people you can draw upon it can be a lot harder then to access society and to get places um, and also there's fragmented public transport often public transport doesn't go on links to certain places unless you have a car which can be very alienating and can accentuate a feeling of loneliness um, for disabled people um, she also talks about how you can be more lonely if you're not in work because obviously employment for a lot of people, employment is where they meet others and it's a source of connection and um, social bonding. Obviously if you're not in work then that does limit your options. I mean you could do voluntary work, I used to do voluntary work before Covid made that impossible because I'm now house practically housebound, I can only well a walk around the same areas, you know. But before COVID, I did do some voluntary work. So you could do voluntary work, um, but it's not quite the same as, say, you know, paid employment where you're on a contract and, you know, and you're interacting with people like that every day or whatever. So obviously, yeah, if you're not in paid employment, if you're not in, the, in, the, if you're not in the work, in the real sense of the word, then it can be a lot harder to you know, to make connections with people, um, which can also mean that maybe it's a higher rate of loneliness, obviously, and the unemployed. Um, or the other thing that can be very alienating, and this feeds into that ethical loneliness that I talked about earlier, was that people often ask you what, they often a, le a question that people ask is, what do you do? Um, so people will often ask, what do you do? Meaning, uh, what do you work, what do you do as a job? What do you work as? People actually shouldn't really ask that question, but it, because it's a bit like asking someone's age when you don't really know them or it's an intimate question that strangers sometimes feel that they can ask but it's actually quite offensive um, because it's yeah it's personal and people don't even people in work might not necessarily want to disclose what they do um, but it's a bit like sometimes you know when you go and get your hair cut I've not had my hair cut for years and I don't really intend on having it cut anytime soon but when Sometimes, like, hairdressers will ask questions like, oh, what do you do? And I do sort of feel that a bit invasive. Um, so, yeah, it's like asking someone's age. Um, it's like, yeah, it's one of those questions that is borderline rude. Um, but people still feel that they have a right to ask it. I mean, it's okay, like I say. 
if you know the person really well, that's a bit different, I think. But I'm talking about complete strangers or people that you don't really know asking these questions because it's, it's a different thing entirely. Well, it's okay if you know the person really, really well, you've got to know them. Because then you're more on a sort of intimate level with them. But, um, I feel, yeah, it's, it's, it depends, I suppose it depends on the context. But, yeah, it can be quite hurtful for some people, particularly if they're out of work, and to ask, answer those questions. Um, so yeah, she also talks. So she talks <clears throat> in this honest level about a disconnect between the autistic and the non-autistic experience. Um, however, I would say it's not quite as binary as that. I would say it's more to do with the disconnect between those in work and those out of work. So someone could be autistic. So in, that's why I say that this whole idea that autistics are automatically going to understand each other just because of shared diagnosis isn't always the case. Because I connect more to autistics I can relate to who are like me who've never been in work, and you know because we have a similar level of connection there. It can be a lot harder to relate to experiences I've never experienced before, but that's the same regardless of someone's diagnosis. So I'm not sure that I'm not I'm not sure that this is just to do with someone's diagnosis or lack of. Um, I mean, after all, there are many non-autistics who might have never worked who might have been a benefit for other reasons, and I will still connect with them. Obviously, we won't share the diagnosis of autism, so there'll still be some areas where we don't connect. But I will still connect with them just based on their experiences of basically being disabled. In, even if it's a different even if it's a different disability, um, so yeah, I don't think it's quite as binary as connecting with someone just because they're autistic or vice versa. Um, yeah, she talk, she makes the important point about austerity, and obviously there has been a lot of austerity and cuts um, to drop-in services that are often crucial for disabled people attending drop-in services and things like that. And Many of these services have now been cut thanks to Tory right-wing government austerity, which makes me very angry. Um, but yes, that obviously uh, drives a um, sense of loneliness because these are often the only places where disabled people can go to meet other people. And many of these places are being cut in groups and things like that. Then she talks... Oh yeah, then they started talking about social media and... Um, it's pros and cons, um, and obviously there are pros and cons, I can't quite remember, I won't go into that, I can't quite remember what they, what the pros and cons were that they came out with, um, but Rachel Fricker said that, um, said that uh, social media, one of the benefits of social media is that you can find out about areas that you struggle with that you might have not previously understood or had a kind of name for. Um, and she talks about body doubling. I've never heard of bo I never heard of bo body doubling before, but it makes sense. Now this is used in the context of ADHD, but I think it can also apply to autism as well, because obviously there's a lot of overlap between the two conditions and areas of struggle. And um, basically, body doubling is where someone is where someone else uh, mirrors mirrors your energy by doing the same task or by being there chatting while you are doing a task which can make it easy which can make it a lot easier to do a task and say if you were to do it on your own so it's um having someone else in the room with you while you're doing a task kind of motivating motivates you um and provides a sense of initiative where being on your own and left to do certain tasks i don't know like cleaning up and something can can be a lot harder than say if there's someone there motivating you which I can relate to, and my support worker would, would often be there as that kind of um, prompt, I guess. But I didn't know it's called body doubling, but that's apparently what it's called. And yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. Then she talks about um, practical loneliness, and practical loneliness is, is to do with um, the barriers in society, such as sensory and social barriers that can make it very hard to enter public spaces. And um, again, there's also the deeper yearning for meaningful connection and the ethical loneliness that many autistic spaces result in societal or systemic barriers. Um, and, and I know that one of you said in the comments that I thought was interesting um, about how the COVID pandemic has potentially um, increased levels of ethical loneliness in people who've been left behind um, because as society moves on people are going oh we're all back to normal now well people who 
who for whatever reason things are not back to normal either because of physical vulnerabilities or because of like extreme mental health anxiety issues around covid um that can feel a greater sense of ethical loneliness because there's a sense that no one understands their predicament that they've been left behind but there's no support out there for them but people ridicule and mock them or don't take them seriously particularly those with mental health problems um so yeah that was a good point and certainly i i i feel that but definitely a, a greater sense of ethical kind of alienation i guess um but yeah, that, I thought it was an interesting point. Okay, so um, moving on now to video number two, because I want to um, start talking about um, an interesting presentation uh, by Dr. Sebastian Crep. Sorry, Dr. Sebastian Gage. Gage on. The subject of uh, alexithymia and autism. Now, this talk uh, was uh, on demand, so it wasn't um, it wasn't a live talk. His talk was on demand, but I actually thought it was one of the more interesting talks. Okay, so moving over to video number two now. <laughs> 